Today, we're going to be exploring the mechanism of mutagenesis of molnupiravir. This molecule we have here as a prodrug, which is an oral antiviral drug that was invented at Emory University and is being developed by Merck in collaboration with the Ridgeback Biotherapeutics. So molnupiravir is actually a broad spectrum antiviral. It was originally developed uh, for influenza, but by now scientists are focusing on fighting the SARS-CoV-2 virus and looks like it reduced the risk of hospitalization or death by approximately 50% compared mm. to yeah. placebo for patients with a mild or moderate COVID-19. Yeah, so Merck plans to seek emergency use authorization in the US as soon as possible and to submit applications to regulatory agencies worldwide. So if authorized, monopiravir could be the first oral antiviral medicine for COVID-19. So yeah, I'm joined by Carla, Mike, and John today. Let's explore a little bit how is the mechanism of action of uh, this prodrug. Hi, Daniel, this is great. Uh, you know, it's really exciting to see this molecule up close and we see it's got an ester on here. And, you know, the ester can, can help monopiravir uh, cross cell membranes, uh, but eventually it gets cleaved to the alcohol by carboxyl esterases in, in the human body. And that itself is also a prodrug. So that's this compound here. And this compound is really interesting because it's very, very closely related to one of our natural nucleosides and the virus's natural nucleoside, uh, cytidine, which we have up here. But this has this hydroxy group on it. And this hydroxy group allows it to at times mimic the hydrogen bonding of cytidine, but also mimic the hydrogen bonding of uracil. And I know you're gonna show that uh, in a structure in just a minute. Um, John, do you wanna talk a little bit about incorporation? Because this is not a, a normal uh, protein uh, inhibitor. It's a different kind of molecule. Oh yeah. So the really cool thing is, and I think thinking about molnupiravir, like, we all thought remdesivir was going to kind of come in and really provide this antiviral support in acute cases. And we all got really excited and it, it didn't quite fall through the way that we were hoping to, but it targeted the same protein. And if we, when we look at the protein uh, and Daniel described it correctly, this is about mutagenesis. This is about this gets fully incorporated into the strand and due to being able to match both purines and pyrimidines, it's able to kind of cause some confusion when trying to replicate the strand. Whereas when we look at um, something like remdesivir, its job is actually to go in and to bind, to be able to be incorporated shortly, but then bind to the polymerase in the palm region typically. And that prevents the elongation of the strand and eventually prevents the virus from being able to capably replicate. So in Monopiravir's case, it's a really cool idea of instead of saying, let's just stop replication, it, it goes into saying like, well, what if, if it did get to replicate, it could only replicate poorly. And since RNA replication only occurs for, you know, RNA positive viruses and RNA, you know, negative strand viruses in the cytosol, it makes it so that the human uh, RNA isn't going to be affected since that's polymerized in the nucleus, giving us a really cool look at a idea of inhibition called compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. That instead of specializing it to a specific protein necessarily, it specifies it to an area of the cell, which is just honestly a fantastic way of reducing off effects and some toxicity factors uh, right. that are inherent to targeting something that looks just like a biomolecule we, we use all the time. That's always the fear. Whenever you make uh, a mimic of an important biomolecule like cytidine, how are you going to prevent it from really just messing with everything in the cell? And compartmentalization here is really how this can be powerful and not be uh, dangerous to patients. But obviously, this is why this is a, a phase two clinical trial that they just got through. 
And while I'm, I'm hopeful this can be used to help people, uh, there is good reason for the FDA to maybe want to see a little more data and want to understand it. So uh, I, I trust them to have suitable caution, but this is, uh, yeah, just sort of the thought from an antiviral perspective of you can either stop the RNA-dependent polymerase from working or you can make sure whatever the product is that it's unproductive and it's unable to create more live viruses. So credit to Emory University for making a, a really cool mechanism, leveraging uh, the system the way they did. Just uh, really cool Super work. Super promising. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Let's show the structure of the RNA polymerase, actually, that we have behind us right now so yeah. we can see how it interacts. We have here... In blue, the RNA template, and mm. uh, in red is the RNA product. And some of the domains are colored here in the polymerase, in the NSP7, NSP8, and NSP12 domains. And so if we scale up the molecule, we can get inside and explore a little bit. We see in white over here, we have molnupiravir. It's bound. We see three hydrogen bonds to the guanine up there and some covalent bonds over here. So yeah, Mike, did you wanna make some additional comments on how this works over here or whoever? Carla's deep in the pocket, so why don't I hand it over to her? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go for it, Carla. <laughs> wow, so we have some really, some three really strong hydrogen bonds going on here between the molecule and uh, the corresponding base pair. It's pretty amazing. Now this is the one that it would normally pair with if it were cytidine, but do we also have an example of where it, it would pair as if it was uracil? Yeah, do we have an pair adenine makes... pair? Yeah. yeah, so I think we have another structure where we have adenine pairing with the uh, hydroxycytidine it's, that molnupiravir put in here. See how it gets incorporated. Yeah. But yeah, overall, just real briefly, this is this is the awesome difference. You can see it looks just like a nucleotide that's been added in. There's no additional kinks or problems that will prevent this from being able to replicate completely. Um, it's just that, as we'll show, the adenine versus guanine, you know, it doesn't have a preference in a lot of ways, is really the uh, the really interesting trick that it's sort of using right. to uh, to do that. Right. It's a cytidine analog, right? R ribonucleoside yeah, but, analog. And so it binds both yeah. with the guanine and with the adenine, like you said. So it, it, it binds mm -hmm. um, and incorporates uh, randomly in many... Mm -hmm different uh, chains that are being produced, but it's making a lot of errors, as you mentioned before, right? So mm -hmm. that pro makes mm -hmm. a lot of mutations that eventually makes the virus non-viable. Non makes the, the drug makes the connection with uh, either the adenine up top here or the guanine. Mm -hmm. So it can but, bind but to any of the tricky part, right? Absolutely. Alrighty, so we're looking at the interaction of molnupiravir with the guanine, and we saw the three hydrogen bonds. I'm actually going to turn on Nanom's measure tool and measure the distance between those. It turns that out that nice. molnupiravir can actually, with this hydroxylamine, mm -hmm. form a tautomer, and that's actually how it um, interacts with an adenine and can couple that way. So oh, let's take a we'll look, look at, at that. that. Yeah. There you go. Right adenine. here. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to delete the other distance. And just for you, uh, nice. People at home looking at hydrogen bonds thinking 3.5 is too far. Uh, my advice is always, yeah, to maybe subtract about 
0.8 off of these measurements to account for the hydrogen that we aren't seeing at the moment. Just True. to put in perspective. Yeah. yeah. Anything less than four between hydro atoms is reasonable. Yeah. All right. Oh, Do we have I a PDF we want to look at? Or? We yep. can see, see the timer, timer you're talking, talking about, about, Carla. About. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and it's really cool to me that it was able to switch, you know, from this being a hydrogen bond donor to an acceptor to really accommodate, uh, you know, the, the change in the profile of the, the purine uh, on the other side and just being able to be flexible in that way. You're, you're sort of getting, you know, two drugs for the price of one. And that's uh, <laughs> this is really cool, yeah. Yeah, it's a great design. Well, good thing it's that oral, question. right? So people can take this drug at home rather than exactly. taking it uh, right. IV oh, in the hospital. Goodness. So it's much much better this way. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. also well, preventative also, from what I read. Well, and even on top of that, like hospitals not having to necessarily you know have them in the you know, in the bed, in the room for them, being able to uh, really reduce the stress on healthcare in other ways. It's a, it's a great point. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks everyone for watching. And uh, of course, we hope that this drug and other drugs uh, gets emergency use authorization as soon as possible so we can treat people and save many lives. Thanks everyone. All right. Thank thanks. you. Thank you. Bye.